Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome to Lincoln University. Welcome to Beeling Innovation. Um, exciting morning, I think, because we're definitely going to look into the future. And uh, so that will be uh, absolutely fantastic with um, some really examples that are really here today. So this will be really cool. Um, for those of you who um, don't know us and, and you know, are here for the first time, welcome for the regular and uh, welcome again. It's fantastic to have you to, to have you back. My name is Linda Koning and I'm leading uh, the building innovation team together with the Canadian and, and, and Tiffany and Tiffany in the back. And we adopted her to be actually working for the Center of the Center of Excellence in Transformative Every Business that is housed in this building as well. Um, today we're going to talk about farm diversification. And but before we get into um, me introducing the speakers, uh, let me give you some housekeeping. Um, we do not expect any fire drills today. So if we have uh, an, an alarm going off, it is the real deal. Um, the door that you can into, we can get out of. Um, there, is a, there is a door here, there are doors that are there. And, uh, and Tiffany, Katie, and myself will make sure that you are being escorted out of the building safely. We will get her in, uh, in front of the grass, uh, in front of the grassy area. Um, toilets, if you walk to, to the end of the room, you turn right, and then it, it is the third door, door on your right hand side, that's where, the, that's where the toilets are. We will be serving, but a lot of you guys have already discovered it, some, some, some coffee and teas and, and, and a little bit of snacks, so you're very welcome to, uh, to help yourself. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we be Link Innovation. We are a full business unit of Lincoln University. And basically what we do is, um, yeah, we actually do a couple of things. One of the things that we're doing is organize these type of events, where we actually bring people together so that we can actually connect you to, to, to one another. And the, the cool thing always is that Katie and myself see that this is going to be a good, a good, uh, a good event if people actually start to talk and I actually have problems bringing people in, 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 into, into, into sitting on their chairs and starting to listen, listen to, the, uh, to, uh, to the talks that are coming simply due to the fact that you guys are connecting, you guys are discovering that what the other person knows or doesn't know is actually, is actually worth, worth discussing. We truly believe that that's when collaboration starts. And when collaboration starts, so when you have two parties involved thinking, hmm, this is actually really interesting if we start talking to each other and there will be a synergetic effect potentially, that's when we think that real innovation actually starts. Um, so um, that's what we do. We have uh, um, some co-working space for um, uh, uh, companies as well that are, that, are in our, that are in our space. So we really are yeah, a positive innovation hub here at Lincoln University. Um, we have three speakers today, and I will introduce them as as, as they go as as, as they as they come on. And it is my great pleasure to introduce um, Alan, uh, uh, Professor Alan Hillary. He is a professor in agriculture economics, and what I think the the most interesting part at the moment is that um, Alan is uh, embracing the transformation that is required for us to move from, from, the, from where we are now in, into the future. And one of those tools is from, from the verification. So as a um, co-chair of the Center of Excellence uh, of uh, um, Transformative Agri Business, I would like to invite Alan up to give his talk. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, My first slide. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, thank you. Yes, uh, my first slide. And I am uh, co chair with um, the name of the Center for Transformative Agri Business. And what I want to do today really is. Um, sorry, I can't first slide. Okay. <laughs> so I had a lot of what I was going to talk about. Um, today, what I want to talk about really is what we mean by diversification. What is diversification? Um, then think a bit more about why we want to diversify, what are the drivers for the change. Then, particularly, I guess, in relation to the topic today, farm diversification for climate change, 
or particularly is that and where might it be different from wider diversification and particularly the purpose? Then I'll talk a little bit about the process of diversification, process of land use change, really what's going on in that process, and then perhaps some opportunities and challenges. I see my role very much as setting the scene. That was the title of my talk for, for me, and I, I will kind of keep it high level. Um, I think more detail will come in the following talks, but I'd be happy to discuss some more detail afterwards. And what I will draw upon throughout the talk, really, uh, as work that we've been doing um, as part of our land and water and other projects and some of my students' work as well, really looking at this issue about transitioning land use in New Zealand um, to perhaps for people more sustainable land uses. Okay. Um, I don't know where to go today. I had a formal definition of uh, diversification. Um, really, one of the simplest way of putting it, I suppose, is this about using the resources on the farm, the available resources, which would be the skills of the farmer, the land, uh, other aspects of the farm, and producing um, other form of alternative production away from the main agricultural production. And really, that can be both alternative crops and, and livestock, as we show here, but it can also be non-farm activities. So when we really begin to think about diversification, uh, we can see really, you know, to classify this sort of thing to whether we're thinking about alternative crops and livestock, aspects as agri-tourism, direct marketing, value-added process, renewable energy production, rural accommodation, and non-farm businesses. So there's a range of things we can think about diversification. And it kind of made me smile because I was thinking about my own farm, where I come from back in uh, Sussex in England, and my brother now farms it. And he's basically trying all of these, as we can see on, on here. So here's the bed and breakfast. Here's the play shooting gallery. He's got a bit of rough land up in the wilds, which is called wild camping. I think just that normal camping in New Zealand, but up in, in Sussex, that's uh, wild camping. This used to be the farm shop. We tried the farm shop for a while, but now it's offices. The farm shop didn't work so well. Um, you've got walks when you come and stay there. We went into processing potatoes and value to them. Um, unfortunately, we were adding more cost than value, so that didn't work out too well. Um, but it's interesting, we've got a whole range of diversification going on here, and they're still broke. So uh, it's kind of interesting uh, exercises going on. And as we come back, you know, the opportunities here are probably quite different to many opportunities in New Zealand. We're located in the south of England, huge population near us, wealthy population, looking to exploit the rural areas a bit more. Um, I think some of our issues here are quite different. So why are we talking about diversification in the New Zealand context? I think clearly climate change is going to be up there and high on our uh, agenda today and going forward. But clearly there's a wide range of both external and internal drivers that are motivating diversification from our traditional livestock, pasture, crop uh, production to other production. And I kind of, in some of the work that we've been doing, we kind of talk about the fish and the pool. So in the pool, people perhaps are looking for alternatives that will um, help raise the income. You know, if I think about our traditional Canterbury mixed farm, it's quite hard to make a profit there, and they're all looking for alternatives. The food is regulation and other environmental factors, social license, that may be challenging some of our systems that we've got now. So really, it's a combination of push and pull drivers that are uh, affecting our decisions to uh, diversify. And again, I guess a theme for my talk, and I keep coming back to it, is that it's going to be different for different people. Okay, it's an individual decision related to their uh, individual circumstances. And so some might be pushed, some might be pulled, but there's a range of factors going on in this way. So today we're really going to focus a bit more on diversification for climate change. So I kind of think, well, there's two aspects to this to me. is diversification for climate change trying to mitigate our emissions. And obviously we know that 50% of our emissions in New Zealand come from the agricultural sector. We're under pressure to reduce those for the sector of New Zealand as a whole. Therefore, there's a pressure in a sense to diversify away from some of our uh, more intensive uh, methane-producing sectors such as dairy to other, perhaps less intensive 
uh, emissions sectors. So on the first hand, this trying to reduce our emissions. And again, there's a strong regulatory um, framework behind that. And so that's the first thing. But also we think about diversification for climate change is the other side of the story. And this doesn't just come from my wife, but <laughs> these folks do. And adaptation, which is her thing. Clearly, whatever happens, the climate's going to change. It's been changing, it's going to carry on changing no matter how well we mitigate at the moment, right? So again, some of our systems, the way they've developed, have developed in relation to our past weather or our current weather, our current climate, um, but actually that's changing. So we also need to think about diversifying our systems to um, deal with climate change and things like this. And if we look at our future projections, you know, further warming, more hot days, fewer cold days, sea level rises, changes in rainfall patterns, increased heavy rainfall intensity, more extreme weather, etc., increasing frequency of drought in the north. You now, these things are obviously going to be creating quite a lot of pressure on our farming systems. And so, we need, in a sense, to diversify our farming systems that allow us to cope with these extremes. That are coming on. So, really, when I'm thinking about diversification, <laughs> both mitigation, changing our systems uh, for, for reducing emissions, but for adaptation to make our systems more resilient. But the, clearly, our advantages of diversification will be beyond climate. And, you know, a lot of the literature would be about you can reduce you know, reliance on a single agricultural product or market, spread financial and other risks. We can take advantage of emerging trends or consumer demands. It might help us tackle succession issues that we have on the farm. So there's a whole range of other factors and advantages associated with diversification beyond the climate as such. And really, we can think about that actually as we don't get back to our talk. We're thinking about is diversification really for increased resilience? How do we make our farming systems more resilient? More able to withstand shocks to um, dairy prices or whatever it may be, uh, environmental regulations, etc., climate, weather. It's about improving the resilience of our farming systems. And that's why we might be wanting to look to um, diversify. And when we're thinking about you know, these, ex these external and internal factors, I think these are really quite important because the motivation and what's driving it will differ, and different stakeholders will have very different views about diversification and the need for diversification as we increase. So just broadly, um, thinking here, what does diversification for climate change look like? Okay, what does it mean? And so we've got a whole list, we have seven or eight different types of diversification that are going on, but really I guess mostly what we're talking about in New Zealand is sort of changing our land use enterprises to run some mitigation terms to reduce emissions. And so this might be substitution, e.g. crops for livestock, lots of discussion about multicultural growth in relation to livestock, or maybe more integration of our systems, e.g. crops and livestock together. Again, we can talk about trees, we can talk about dairy sheep, we can talk about a whole range of possible enterprises in, in this situation. With adaptation, again, I think we're thinking about adoption of land use enterprises that increase our resilience of our farm business to climatic events and talk about diversifying our farm business, making it less dependent on particular events or whatever. But maybe then that overall resilience actually isn't just about changing land use, it's maybe about the farm and non-farm diversification opportunities as well, so you're not so reliant on that stream of income climate damages your crops, etc. you have other streams of income. So adaptation can, I think, include the much wider church of uh, uh, diversification options. I just put a little graph up here from the work we were doing with uh, Steve Thomas that he, he led over here. And this work in uh, just looking at what happens if we put promising crop enterprises, which we talk a bit more, and have a land use substitution. So move some land out of dairy, um, cattle feed and cattle, and put it into uh, horticultural crops, largely the ones we were looking at. And we can see here, we don't need to stay too long on this. But what we're fundamentally showing is that in theory, on paper, we can increase profitability and reduce emissions from this activity. But it's a long way from my and Steve's office 
to the reality of the farm, okay? And, that, and that's the challenge. So we, we, we've highlighted in this report that, yes, on paper, it looks fine, but there's a lot of challenges with infrastructure support and a whole range of factors that actually made, made us less promising. Uh, so we're thinking about diversification. The next thing you really want to think about is the process. And that's sort of arguing point already. It's a very individual process, and it will be different by farm, different by region, all sorts of factors will determine it. Because in some regions, it might be uh, water quality that's pushing it. In others, it might be opportunities, such as central plains water, these sorts of things. We have different opportunities for diversification, different challenges for it. So we're thinking about our strategies. Then we do need to think about where the farm is sitting, as I say, going back to my brother's farm, quite nicely located near Portsmouth, between Portsmouth and Brighton, a large population, lots of opportunities to do that. But also, what resources are available on the farm? Again, if you're thinking about changing to alternative crops or whatever it is, we need to think about what the market demand is. And one of the things we will come back to when we talk about niche, sometimes it's about creating a market demand. Uh, and you're actually trying to put a, a very new product in. Then obviously related to local regulations and um, the skills and interests of farmers themselves. We used to joke, I mean, diversification has been a topic in the UK for an awful long time. A lot of money spent by the EU trying to encourage people to diversify. But we kind of felt, you know, a lot of things about, you know, whether it was bed and breakfast or hospitality and stuff, and we kind of felt, I think you need to match this to the skills of the farmers. The farmers in the UK are not really known as the most social uh, people, and moving them from looking after a cow, trying to host a group of people on the farm, may not necessarily match their natural skills. So clearly, it needs to fit with the interests and skills of the farmer themselves. <laughs> So in the work that we were doing, which is part of a, another part of the work we were doing with our, our land and water, we were really trying to sort of conceptualize this idea of land use change. I sort of adapted this for diversification today. But really, what we've got here is the characteristics of our current system. Then we've got all these drivers working us, price signals, policy instruments, etc. And then we have the characteristics of our land use and diversification. And then we need to match that in a way, or inter interrelate that with the motivations and perceptions of the land manager themselves and the characteristics of the land that they've got. And so the way we kind of visualize this is, you know, these things come together and very often we will see the way diversification works is through really taking up a trial. Let's try it on a small scale, let's see if it begins to work and then we can go to adoption or we might go further down straight to adoption. And in the work we were looking at land use transformation, the, the green line here were the sort of six broad areas that we saw as important the farmers, the land managers were taking into account when they began to think about uh, the process of what they want from a land use change. So under the financial market knowledge, regulation, social well-being and environment, we then had a sort of what we call subdomains, a whole range of other factors that would be taken into account. So, for example, financial might be about the capital investment, profitability, market might be about scale, um, knowledge is about what's available, is the support available, etc. Then you know, general regulations and issues about quality of life, social well-being, and then impact on the environment as well. So what we did in this bit of work basically we went and spoke to in the end about 25, 28 land managers who were considerably changing their land use to see the weighting that they put on these varying things. I've always changed a bit since we put it up. Um, okay, it's a bit of a mess. It's gone here. And the purpose of this actually is to show you it's a bit of a mess, right? And uh, really what we're trying to show here is the variation that's going on for individual land managers when they're thinking about transforming their land, right? And the weight that they put on the different domains, financial markets, social, environmental knowledge and regulation, and also the different back to this, the different subdomains in here, right? And again, it comes back to this individual decision making that's going on and what people are looking for when they're trying to transform their land. So the process, farmers coming out, thinking about it, interacting with what's going on out there, the drivers, etc. 
So we really just want to kind of think a bit more about what the challenges and questions with diversification. Uh, risk is obviously a very key part involved in this, right? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Finding profitable enterprises, okay, in the town of but really that's like a lot of the work we did with Central Plains Water, a lot of work we did throughout the country looking you know, at transformation. It's the key difficult thing, right? We can find lots of enterprises, as I've shown in a moment, that may be environmentally friendly, maybe more socially friendly, and other factors, but really that are very difficult to compete with dairy and with the looking at that as particular pressure for land use and change. And again, what we found for people who are doing this, you know, again, making sure we add value and not just cost and complexity to the business. You know, when some of the people I was interviewing out the central plains, part of the interview was spent going through the rotation that they had on their farm. They had 12 different enterprises and trying to spend the half of life trying to work out how they fit them into the farm. A huge amount of complexity, but people trying to diversify, just trying to raise that, that revenue. And, and coming back to that, you know, again, other ones we were saying, you know, saying what can happen with diversification if you're not careful, because you're basically trying to develop the market yourself. We're trying to learn the techniques, new production, etc. Is that what what is effectively ten percent of your business takes up eighty or ninety percent of your time, and your main business suffers. And I think that's you know, a particular challenge. For it. And of course, the key thing when we're thinking about alternatives is can we capture the fear or do we lose it down the chain? And that's always a challenge. And We've got a lovely duopoly supermarket system here, yeah, right at that part of the chain. But clearly, it's it, Tax the value can be captured um, right through it. Where will the information and knowledge come from? And in sitting with that has been working about farms and understanding their information sources and how they use them. I'll talk a bit more about that. What are those implications in environment and social? How will it be financed? When I say how far I've got who here, I mean really who do you work with and how far down the supply chain? Do you get all the value chain as part of the key issue um, for decisions? This little bit of work here, actually, I'll just talk briefly about this because I've got a couple of minutes. Um, so, we were doing some work on alternative proteins um, for the greenhouse gas uh, research um, center. And one of the things we were trying to think about were the opportunities um, well, for peas for protein, oats for oatmeal, chestnuts for flour. And what we were trying to work out in a sense is, you know, that part of the challenge is, you know, we can grow oats, we can grow peas, but we're not growing huge amounts at the moment because they're not particularly competitive with other things that are, that are going on in our land uses. So are we really, even if we have a new market, is it actually going to boost the price that gets to the farmer because otherwise it's not potentially going to, going to work? And I kind of got this idea that's really, if you think about alternative proteins, there's sort of three ceilings on what we can do because Companies could just import the raw materials, oats, pea protein, you know, it's 250,000 ton pea protein plant just opened in Canada. They can produce it pretty cheaply. We can use that as our ingredient, yeah? Also, we can, so that's important too, oats. Okay, you import the processed product, that's the pea protein, I should be talking about that, or we can just import the final product. And they really put ceilings on what we could do in New Zealand. Now, I was kind of just trying to get this idea, I'm not sure I really pulled it through, Okay, we need a premium to get people in to start producing this. So we've premium to the grower, then adds the cost to process, and the process wants a premium to them, and then we become kind of uncompetitive. So we need to have a value proposition as to what, so we waved that out a little bit, so a value proposition as to why we would pay more for pea protein from New Zealand as we would from Canada, okay? Or why we would pay more for oat milk from New Zealand than we would from opening. So, okay, so that's a real challenge, I think, for some of this diversification thing that we're looking at. As I said, risk is crucially important in here. And you know, again, adoption of new systems, technologies will involve some risk for us, maybe unproven in the farm situation, might need to borrow money, capital investment, may need to learn new skills, change in our financial practice might change our farming system and involve learning. So risk is a, a key component. But on the other hand, as we've already said, you know, new systems can reduce some of those risks that we're also facing. Um, again, through regulating compliance, 
might reduce variability in product, may improve our profitability. Mm -hmm. So, but risk is something I haven't got too much time to talk about. I just want to highlight. So, again, this is the work we were doing with Steve, and these were some of the enterprises we viewed as promising to think about alternatives to, to livestock um, production. But of course, this is a very narrow project, and there's obviously, as you said, many sheep. There's some people in the audience here, and uh, forests and trees and other products. Okay, but clearly, there's a huge range of things here. But really, what's going to be profitable at the farm level for us is going to be a big challenge for us. And in this, we were kind of highlighting these letters here E, B, P, G, H, sort of relate to what really would be driving demand for them, why they might be not <laughs> profitable in the marketplace for us to look at. So just a last couple of minutes, to think really, if we're going through that process, we need information, we need knowledge, and we need support. Uh, so this is the work Amy's been doing, really, uh, we're trying to understand if we're wanting to transition our land uses, if we want to move from its diversification or more wide, you know, wider change in the farming system, then we need information and, and that. So we've been trying to work in here, really thinking, how farmers are getting their information and how they're using that information. Because the next stage is they can it begin to influence this to try and get the influence on the farmers. So I think um, I won't go into it too much, but uh, Amy can talk to you afterwards about it. But I think it's really interesting here, you know, the informal network and the strength of this it is really strong in the discussions that we're having. And the, you, you know, other sorts of work I've been involved is very quantitative. And they work out, you know, do you use your iPhone? Yes, no. Is your profit higher? Yes, no. Okay, iPhones give you more profit. End of story. <laughs> but what I think is really trying to look at is how they're using it, who are they connecting with? You know, is it core of sense? Is it, um, gosh, I forgot to my favorite farming lobby group, what we called Groundswell. Groundswell, yeah. yeah. You know, is it Groundswell? Who, who are they getting information from? <laughs> and then how does that relate to our um, formal our banks? our reps, organizations, etc., and things like that. Okay. So one of the issues I think and the challenge for us is that we are a very siloed agricultural sector, okay? So Red Meat has their whole research and extension team, dairy has its whole research and extension, forestry does, seafood, horticulture and crops should probably be together here. I haven't got them here, but again, and that's fine if you're trying to specialize in that, but if we want diversification, which is moving across these in our matrix approach, that's where some of our challenges arise, actually, because dairy and Z aren't necessarily going to give you advice on growing kiwi fruit on your farm, are they? It's not in their interest as such, and that sort of thing might go on. But clearly, I think what we've seen as the push is becoming is kind of lagging behind, but information and support is becoming more available. So our land and water have just, you know, just released their data supermarket, and some of these things they have in there, for example, are some more information about land use suitability. So this is for kiwi fruit coming into mid-century as the climate changes. And actually, quite interesting, it's not too bad around here. We might get some. I haven't quite got it down to a central target yet, because that was there, but potentially changing things. But clearly, again, a bit like that other report, there's one thing to say the land is suitable, there's <laughs> another thing to actually get us into the industry in these areas. And of course, MPI have now got their on-farm support system, trying to kind of bridge that gap and help people get some information they need. Right, I'm running out of time. I just wanted to just lastly really to say a couple of things about you know, the sorts of discussion we had in the Central Plains Water when we were looking at push and pull of dairy again, and this is the challenge diversified things have got to use, you know. Dairy is really, so it's probably just any dairy farmers, it's a really simple system in some way, yeah. You grow grass, you have the cows, you just protect the grass, etc. yeah. As I was saying, I was looking at the mixed farm, I was looking at the 12 different enterprises, trying to manage all those, it's quite Difficult, yeah, and also dairy, you don't have to worry about marketing, a tank that will come up, take the milk away, you never have to worry about it. Yeah? All these diversified opportunities we've got will have key challenges. Maybe. So, just a few quotes from that. As I said, there really what we were finding so, dairy's got the market, finance, and knowledge that's great. Other sectors may have you know, environmental benefits, it lets you comply with regulations better than social, but it's very hard. Find these diversified opportunities 
that will provide you with finance and these other benefits as well, as we will be doing. But potentially, I know the next year we're an alliance, potentially finance helping on the way is there. You know, they're going to now have to think about their scope of two emissions associated with the banks, how they're lending affects the customers. So they're looking for low carbon projects to help their lending that, you know, their portfolio. They signed up to this net zero banking alliance. So a lot of banks are looking at how their portfolio works, and that could help support some of this diversification. So really here, the final thing you saw the issues about, again, I'm looking at Nick here and Nick Bill to say, do you do it on your own? Okay, or as a group, you put your supply, and how far do you go? Do you just grow and supply, in which case that might limit your returns? More risk, investment issues, moving up to processing, more risk, et cetera, roving up to your own brand. Okay, so again, what we're kind of arguing is partnerships, having people who work, you know, I think Netfield doing a lot of linking processing with grow supply. That's the idea to try and get the market because you know there's always that chicken and egg situation and dairy milk was the classic, you know. Wouldn't build a processing plant because there are no suppliers, no suppliers because there's no processing plant. You know, that sort of challenge in our, in our system going on here. We'll talk a little bit about niche mainstream, but I don't really need to talk about that. So I really just want to finish, I guess, is about what we're trying to achieve. And it's a little bit work I did with uh, Karen Bay and Simon. What we're looking for at a societal level, I guess, or a regulatory level or whatever, is a diversified landscape. Okay? We want a relatively low emission, but you know, with argue that many countries have shown the best model for biodiversity in the environments is a mixed farming model, right? And so that's potentially what we're trying to achieve in this, uh, with the pressure we're putting on farms. We can get it from mixed farming, but the problem is mixed farming struggles for profitability. We can get it through diversification, so that individual farms diversify. We can get it through what we call diversified specialization. You stay doing what you're doing, but you let someone specialized come in to grow their crops, you know, like we have a bit with potatoes and carrots, etc. We can do it through intensified diversification. What we mean by this is to grow wine, and then you have some sheep grazing under the vine, you kind of then using the land for two potential. We can think about more intensity in sparing land, less intensity sharing land, then we can have, you know, circular symbiosis here. Okay, there's some varying ways that we can get to that. It's not just the individual having to all the diversification, there's a range of ways around it. So just finishing really clearly, we got um potential for diversification to help address many of the challenges the sector faces, but we've got quite a lot of challenges and moving from that potential to reality on the farm. And the literature kind of really tells us that successful farm diversification generally is very well planned, based on risk management and things like that, fits with the skills resources available, often incremental. You don't go whole scale, you try it out, does it work? You move up a little bit. And generally, and needed a strong relationship. So that's the way you develop your market and your partnerships to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Um, introduce me, Stuart Taylor from Great More Sustainables. Um, Stuart is the general manager of Great More Sustainables. They're managing 25,000 hectares of land approximately throughout New Zealand. And they have already a diversified uh, business model. They're looking at forestry, they're looking at dairy, and they're looking at what's going to be. Sure, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, so, uh, so with a great one, um, there's a mixture of different uh, enterprises. So, I'm actually general manager of farming, and there's a general manager of forestry and horticulture as well. Uh, so, in horticulture, we have kiwi fruits in the North Island, top of the North Island, avocados. There's uh, market gardening near Gisborne, as well as uh, uh, mixed crops. Uh, and there's grapes, apples, hops, uh, and I'm just looking into cherries. Uh, we've got forestry, that's all on the North Island, so that's a uh, wire a little bit around the East Coast uh, and mainly expanding north at the moment. Uh, in the economic business, I'll, um, there's, there's 16 down in County directly managed. And then the other 16,000 that's um, we have subsidiary ownership and 
Uh, so the ownership structure is mainly Western European um, investors. Uh, there are some New Zealand investors as well. Uh, but this company is in there like Tesco's uh, CERN. CERN, um, the scientists that create the headline collider, they're one of the investors. Um, and MEAG, which is an international um, property investing company. So, um, so I might, um, might actually take you back in time a little bit to, uh, uh, to where I started. So this fellow here with the cool pants, <laughs> so, that's, so that's me, my two sisters and my parents. So that's on actually my grandfather's farm, uh, just west of Funaray. So that's, uh, that's kind of where they started the investment journey. They actually met in the, um, in the Carmo Rugby Club, just north of uh, Funaray. Uh, father played for the seniors, and my mother was uh, the coach's daughter's friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> fifth generation farmers, both of them. So, the, the, the families came out from, my family came out from uh, Western Europe and settled here over the last 150 years. So, um, yeah, so definitely uh, generations of farmers. All my uncles were farmers, except for one of my aunties, she was a teacher. We didn't really talk too much. <laughs> so, uh, so they started uh, shear milking just north of Tungaroa. They put 400 cows through a tin side shear in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. So the government actually paid us to drain the peat swamps just north of, of Tungaroa. Uh, so they worked there for eight years before they saved $60,000 by their first farm in 1981, just southwest of Tungaroa. So they sold uh, 150 cows for $150 each, and that was the Deposit on their first farm and bought it in 1981. And this is the road I used to wait for the bus. I want to use the gravel then, not to seal. This is the house that uh, I grew up in, me and my two sisters. And that uh, small 80, 90 cow farm uh, put uh, me and my sisters through university. And uh, mother's still there today. She's running that farm at 79, looking after her now 100 hectare farm. So what did we have? So we had um, a country that was developing. So ever since we got here about 800 years ago, humans have been developing this country to become richer. Uh, we've been draining swamps and cutting down forests and using horticulture and agriculture to become more wealthy. So New Zealand wanted us to be productive right up until probably the, I, I guess we started hearing noises from society, maybe the late 70s uh, and then 80s and, and 90s. But it was probably more like the 2000s that the noise really got louder. So that was really just the time of saying we've drained enough swamps and cut down enough forests. So it's time to be a little bit more balanced. Uh, what we've always done as farmers and horticulturalists is shared innovations and ideas. And uh, we'd share what worked and we'd try and do more of that. And we'd share what didn't work and do less of that. Uh, at the time, the average farm was about 150 cows. Now it's uh, 450, 500 cows. Uh, and I remember back working with my father. So we used to do trials on our farm, and then have presentations to the farmers. So that was government working with farmers to create solutions. It was around productivity at that stage, but that's remember what um, society wanted. So I kind of uh, left my dad's cow shed. He actually milked there since 1981 until about 2005. Just every day I didn't miss the milking. But uh, I took my after university, I took my uh, farming to Waikato, so that's just west of Hamilton. I put 800 cows through a 36 side shed on a peak swamp. That was hard work. Uh, and from the Waikato, I actually went down to uh, the west coast of Wamadu on the sand country. And I took that same mentality. So we had a team of bulldozers and support staff. My kid was telling me some of the irrigators then. Uh, so we're draining, so we're spreading out sand hills on the sand country there putting down bores to half a kilometre and turning uh, sand country into dairy farms. And from there, about uh, four years ago, I came and worked for Craigmore Sustainable. So Craigmore's got 4,000 cows up in Coverton. There's uh, 1,200 cows just out of Oxford. <coughs> just down by Tipperida, there's another 950 cows. And then uh, down Hines, it's 4,000 cows just on the coastal strip there. Over by Methland, there's a, another 2,000 cows. 
they were all down the coastal strip of of Canterbury and into north uh, into into south of the Maru, fifteen hundred cows to Parinora, and then down towards Omaru, it's five thousand cows just west of Omaru, and then the last parcel of land in farming is down the middle March. And the middle much farm is thousand hectares of, of flat irrigated country and another couple of thousand hectares of high country. So we employ 150 people. Up. And then I've got my own farm on the coast just by Ashburton that I actually own a partnership with my mother and another friend of mine. And uh, he's still selling irrigators, actually. So we'll just take you back through that uh, journey, which is my journey, but also a little bit of the journey of New Zealand agriculture and farming over, over the last 30, 40 years. So we went from being paid by the government to drain swamps, cut down forests in the 80s, to uh, me taking that mentality and, and believing that I had the backing of New Zealand society to be productive, to, uh, to, to spreading out sandhills, around the Monganui coast and turning that into irrigated dairy land. And it was then that I uh, started interacting with people, people like Peter Taylor from Horizons Regional Council. And uh, Mike Joy, I put him out onto the farm at one stage. And I started interacting with Dave Watt, who's Massey University, and Ranveer Singh, who's also Massey University. And it was uh, interesting as I as I leaned into the people that were bringing in regulation to understand their perspective, it was then that I started to, to uh, or look into the issues around farming on sand country in Monganui. So we, so we so I split it down into the different areas. I did a whole lot of around as people and animals, but from an environmental perspective, I started to track the nutrient nutrients as they as they went across the farm, and we found that uh, the nitrate wasn't going down. But it was it was exiting out through the drain system, and we're actually losing a lot of nitrate through uh, denitrification into the air, and it was actually uh, Eden two rather than uh, nitrous oxide, which is interesting. So it was about leaning into the problem, and understanding it, and then looking at solutions. So from that, then we're setting up wetlands and um, wood chip bioreactors to mitigate the end loss of the of the property. I was only starting then to look into the greenhouse gas effect. We're starting to measure the carbon that was getting built up onto that soil. So we're running a mixed um, pasture cropping system on that sand country because ryegrass and grow on it. So we go through rows and sorghum and then into fescue and brogue based grasses. So it was so it was I was using innovation like we always have, partnering with experts like MAF or, or Mass University to then come up with solutions. And I think the other really important factor was to lean into the to the agitator or the regulator to understand their perspective. So it's kind of brings me, th and that brought me into the Craigmore role. And, and I think as, as a farming industry, we've got two directions. So we can either de-intensify, I'm keeping away from all those names around de-intensification de because I think that just confuses things, like regeneration. So it basically comes to fewer inputs, less pollution per hectare, and fewer outputs. There's less two total food produced because it's a less intensive system. And it's actually harder to be profitable and you need to be able to differentiate your product to make that money, which is extremely hard to do in New Zealand, as you, you already. It's actually extremely hard to do in the world because there's that, not that many rich people in the world. So everyone in this room is the top 1% of rich people in the world. And you have to be extremely rich or extremely motivated to buy your food products in a, from a sustainable point of view, because it always costs more. And most people, most rich people in the world are focused on other things. Or you can intensify it. So intensify it to increase inputs, more pollution maybe, more outputs, but there's less per pollution per value of product, which is a contradiction. So I've got I've got Montero saying I should have less pollution per kg of milk solid, and I've got New Zealand saying I need to do less pollution per hectare, which is actually a conflict. 
because Frontier has got a, a customer that wants to lease two kg. And if you intensify and become more efficient, you actually reduce the pollution per kg. That's scope one, scope two. Uh, there is a law of diminishing returns when you intensify. It's a harder system to run, but also a de-intensified system is a harder system to run as well. So, what's the reality right now? More than ever, New Zealand as a country is 100% reliant on primary industries to be able to innovate to solve solutions. Actually, the whole world is reliant on farmers uh, and horticulturalists to uh, produce more food in a more sustainable way. And I don't actually think that going to a different food source is a solution. Because every food source has an issue. Even in the in the Craigmore group, with, with diversified through the group and through the country and to mitigate risk. But every part of the business has an issue around pollution, whether it's carry fruit or grapes or uh, avocados, there's a there's an outcome of our human activity. Um, we can't do it by ourselves anymore. We actually have to go to the world for solutions because the problem is more complex. In the 70s and 80s, it was about how do we be more productive? We had that technology and understanding. Now we have to go to the world, world for it because it's more like um, how do we get this genetic change in our animals or our plants to put the solutions? And we can't do that ourselves. We have to go to the world. Uh, we have to celebrate our innovators again. We kind of forgot and definitely in the dairy industry to celebrate our innovators because from the mid 90s, people that were successful were the ones that did scale and scaled up and they became really successful rather than being innovators. But the best thing about the banking industry being more balanced now is that we have to go back to being a really good farmer or a really good horticulturist. And it's the innovators that become successful. You kind of hear the noise, eh? everyone's scared of the innovators, they run them down. That's because they're scared of the change, but it actually has to be, you let those guys go, you let them have a go, and if they fail, that's great, you learn from them, if they succeed, you, you're the first follower. There's a, I'm encouraging change in, in the New Zealand primary industries to celebrate the innovators rather than run them down. And just remember that we need to go back to what we're great at as a country, but as a primary industry, we're really good at innovating and solving problems. So I might just run through what we're doing in Craigville Farming, some of the innovations, just for your information. So we measured all that soil carbon last year, so we're going to track that over time. We keep looking at solar arrays and trying to make that work. Someone here's from Rams down there. So we did Eco Pond this year. So Eco Pond reduces greenhouse gases off the dairy farm 5 to 7 percent by treating it that way. Uh, we did the cow poncha, which is a Pontera product. So that's uh, that's treating the calf with a, a, a prebiotic and changes the, uh, the rumen activity. So that's a 20% reduction for the animal per year for the rest of its life. So we've got uh, insetting with trees, uh, doing work with a, a French company around measuring fatty acids. So there's, a, there's, a, there's possibly a lineup between the fast, fatty acid content of the milk and how much methane she's producing. So you can herd test the national herd to find out which ones are producing the most milk with the least methane. We can pull that one off, that's transformational. We're doing a, in the ground, we're doing the dung beetles piece, a biodiversity plant, we're planning for the, for the most important parts of our biodiversity assets across the group. Doing regular soil assessments, soil mapping and, and accurate fertilizer. But working around with a robotic weak spray, it's still coming through, but basically it's a, Robot about this side on on uh, self laying tracks. We'll go out to the paddock, identify the, the weed and then spray it. There's a sustainable point around that, around less chemical use, but there's also a big uh, safety factor around people not exposing them to um, to, to sprays, etc. Uh, we work with um, Pablo on a regenerative trial in Lincoln University down at Craigmore Station. Got a composting barn operating down in Omaru, so. Farm down there does two and a half thousand solids a hectare, and he only leaches five units of air. He's got a composting barn, and he's actually got nutrient capture bombs. So, if, if uh, water runs across the farm and, and tries to exit through the drain system, we capture the ponds and put it back through the irrigation. Um, low air trials through the group, we 
working with um, home students, etc. There's a um, um, uh, there's a bar to Jessica we're putting it up in, in uh, North Canterbury, so that's the wood chip chip stripping device. Uh, do the stream health assessments on the on the animal side because remember sustainability is around animal performance. So we've got the in room inspect tech folder so that monitors the cow health and performance. I've got the halter, but that's more of a, a people factor than an animal animal factor. We've got uh, extended life programs for robotic calves. Played around with robotic back and gate, but it didn't really work. Um, so we walked away with that one. Um, a, a real strategic herd improvement plan for our, for our cows, because it's um, in the end, it's a cow performance is a big driver of reduced methane per kg of oxide. There's um, OmniEye, which monitors the cow addition score and picks out lane cows. So that's another factor of making sure the animal's looked after, but she's performing. Of course, you can't have anything without a high performance team. So I can dream up anything I like, but without having high performance people on farm, I'm just never going to get it. So that's around regular training and leadership, as well as how a team performs. And of course, you can't have anything without financial planning and sustainability. Uh, we set up our own sustainable link loans this year, working with Rabo and um, ASB. So there's a four factor to it. There's um, a people factor, so independent consultant comes in and assesses our leaders, whether up to, up to scale. There's a biodiversity plan, and whether we're enacting that in relation to the plan, um, conditions for our cows pre mating. So that's are we looking after our animals? And then the last one is reduction. In, Greenhouse gas. So that's total greenhouse gas plus per kg. So we have to hit those two factors. So we have to do less per hectare and do less per kg, which is actually the ultimate answer to my question that was earlier. So there's a, there's a big download. I tried to drop lots of information into you really quickly. A lot of that was just uh, simulated questions later. So thanks very much. Sure, and at the end of the sessions, so after we've first fossil fuel, there are different types of analysis. Um, I'd like to introduce Mike Casey. Uh, he ran up a farm without fossil fuel, if possible. Well, I'm not going to steal away his phone, I'm going to give the floor to Mike. Yeah. Well, uh, probably right on about Spoke to familiar faces in this room, so which, is, which is pretty cool because a lot of people have heard me babble before and they keep coming back. So we must be saying something right. Um, my name is Mike, and I'm here today to talk to you about my farm, uh, which is a cherry farm in central Otago, where we have completely eliminated fossil fuels. Uh, and so, what that means is that everything that we do, all our business processes, processes are entirely eliminated. A little bit about me. This is me in 2008, leaving at Victoria University in Wellington, um, heading overseas to Sydney uh, to start my software start. I had a background in software engineering, uh, and then I sold my business uh, to Seek in 2019, uh, which gave me the very important circumstance my wife and I of being able to move back to New Zealand with a reasonable level of capital um, to start a complete new chapter. And we wanted to move back to this region, the Queenstown Wanaka Lakes region, um, because both of us and our kids really love everything about this region. Um, if you have a choice of moving anywhere in New Zealand, um, this is one of the ones that we thought, yet yeah, this is absolutely, absolutely where we want to be. And we were looking for a four bedroom house in, say, Wanaka, the Queenstown region. And what we actually found is this one. So it is a house. Just on the, where we call Mount Paisa, um, just right near uh, the, the delta of Lake Dunstan, about 10 minutes north of Bromwell, about half an hour south of the four bedroom house we were looking for, for the same price as a four bedroom house in Queenstown, Wanaka, but with nine hectares of land. The entrepreneur in me was like, well, this has got to be an opportunity that we can turn, we get to capitalize on. And I always knew that the next thing I wanted to do was in the climate change space. So I'd become in Sydney what most of you would call it in the city lefty. Um, I was convinced that the next thing that I wanted to get to was in climate. Um, and I was frustrated because I didn't see the primary industry was really doing enough. I couldn't see why it was that they weren't acting on something that I thought was so obvious. So I thought, 
What if I could do with my head as a spare man and become a farmer? If I become a farmer, either I prove myself right and, and can lead by example, or maybe, maybe some of my assumptions are wrong and I can come back much better towards the centre. So uh, instead of uh, farming sheep, which is what was come, currently done on these this, uh, nine hectares of land, we planted 9,300 cherry trees, which put in perspective is about 25 kilometres of cherry trees. So it's a reasonably significant number of cherry trees for an individual farmer on the higher side there, uh, but we get to walk by a big conglomerate of small of those guys that plant hundreds of hectares of cherries. And then I'm going to do the numbers, and the numbers weren't great. I thought that by planting 9,300 trees, I was immediately making a difference to the climate. But in reality, when I got the people in that knew what they were doing, they measured the circumferences of trees and work through the behavior on how we prune trees and everything like that, works out that we sequester about not half, about 3.8 tons of carbon per year, uh, which is actually really little, really not a lot. Um, interestingly enough, it does at least offset the fertilizer that we put on. We put about 2.5 tons of fertilizer uh, emissions on a year. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. We need to do emit 60 tons of emissions through diesel to run a productive cherry function. So, in other words, horticulture is not good for the climate. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey to Central Otago to Forest Road, which is my cherry orchard, where we have completely eliminated fossil fuels. Uh, essentially, the process of every time a decision, we started with a blank canvas, every time a decision came up on what we should be buying, we always researched out the electric option and we weren't scared to pay more. Um, by the way, no modeling was done doing this. It's just this altruistic perspective with the guy that had a bit of capital that let's go and see if we can make this happen. And then on the other side of it, look, I'll, I'll, I'll be transparent and share all the numbers of what's good and what's bad, and therefore come up with some conclusions on what I think needs to happen in this country in order to encourage this process. So, before we start, this is the payback periods. So, we have two. We have two different payback periods that I talk about. One is the additional capital cost, which I'm mm -hmm. uh, referred to as the incremental capital cost, which is how much more expensive. I start with the bank have to spend money on something like an irrigation pump. How much more expensive is the electric version compared to the diesel version? Um, then I add in government grants, um, and so what we're looking at here is a payback period on the additional cost of capital in the general market at the moment of about eight years. One of the big issues that we have is electric technology is generally meant to last about 10 years. So you can see right here, while there is benefit from the private sector doing this sort of stuff, it's not actually that significant. And if I'm trying to encourage change in the industry, we're trying to encourage change away from the uh, living fossil uh, of, of emissions through fossil fuels, that really isn't enough for the, the market to encourage change. However, with government intervention, and I've actually been pretty good at getting some government intervention, which has been really nice, we've really halved that payback period. And we'll go into that in a lot more detail soon. <laughs> um, also, one of the other important things to talk about is I talk about the incremental cost, which is really important for me because I had a blank canvas. So if I was going to create a cherry orchard, I had to spend this money anyway. So therefore, that is the most important thing for me. However, I'm turning around and asking a farmer to electrify when they already have perfectly good working technology, perfectly good working processes. The total capital back there is what's important. And that's a real problem because it's 11 years with grants and 14 years with no grants, which should just be on the life expectancy of the new technology that they would be purchasing. Um, and so that is uh, part of what I'm going to tell the story about today of, of not only how we've achieved this, but also what I think needs to happen next. So in order to do this, um, we I have done all these calculations on a couple of assumptions. So you have to remember, I've actually not burned any diesel. Creating uh, uh, this orchard. Um, and so we've had to come up with a figure. Now, at the moment, diesel is about $2 a litre. So these are fairly up to date figures based on the model we did sort of back in December last year. Um, and I'm also including line charges, I've put it in a cost of about 25 cents a kilowatt hour. So that's keeping everything uh, reasonably simple for these calculations. And then what I've done is I've gone through and uh, calculated exactly across every energy stream. Um, the difference, the, the, the difference in price between the diesel and the electric version, and how long it takes to pay it back. Now, one of the important things to know is the soft costs associated with doing this. I pay one hundred and ten thousand dollars to upgrade a switchboard, a transformer, and the lines between the transformer and the switchboard in order to make this happen. And that was almost like the ante to play the game, right? So, 
One of the biggest barriers I have to entry at the moment, and something that is not covered by government grants at all, and something that I am very, very vocal about, and even could be covered by government grants, is the barrier to entry. In order to be able to electrify, we need to have access to the grid. And if that is the biggest barrier to entry, then we're not going to enable uh, farmers to electrify. Because bearing in mind, everything I, I, I'm about to show you requires that access. So this is $110,000 to actually have no gap. Right, it's $110,000 just to get to the point where we can start to spend money to make the game. Irrigation, I know there's some waterfall side of the room, so that probably look at my numbers that we can raise somewhere else, but this is exactly what we spent when we decided to oh, go back a little bit. Our, our farm came with a really old clunky diesel pump that ran a clay K line to irrigate, irrigate grass to, to grow sheep essentially. And, um, that pump was on its last legs, but not only that, it wasn't going to have the capacity we needed for it to irrigate, um, irrigate our cherry trees. And not only that, of course, I didn't really want to use that anymore. Um, and so what we did is we decided to go down, instead of using our irrigation dam uh, and pumping water directly from that, we drilled the bore, uh, put an electric submersible pump into that, and, uh, um, and, and started running our irrigation electrically. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the, um, the payback period on this is actually pretty good. And I think that's why we see most pastoral farmers around here are irrigating electricity, right? Because the numbers actually do stack up. So that's a, that's a really important thing to know. But by doing this, um, which is something in horticulture, especially in central Otago, the majority of irrigation is still done off either, either electric pumps with diesel generators or with diesel pumps. Um, so by doing this, it's still sharp to be able to show people in the horticulture industry, especially in my, uh, in my region, that this actually works, but of course it doesn't work with the hundred and ten thousand dollar upgrade required to run it. Okay, um, but it does work in isolation. So we have to look at electrification in the big picture, which is everything. So the second thing is phosphide. Um, a lot of people told me that there was, you know, that we wouldn't have access to enough power in order to phosphide using electricity, which would seem really strange to me coming from a technology background, uh, because. All we're doing is spinning a problem, right? It's spinning a problem in a stationary environment. So surely, therefore, we would have enough power to be able to do the same job as what these diesel frost fighting plants are. So those of you who've seen these diesel frost fighting plants littered across the country, they will burn anywhere between 30 to 40 litres of diesel power. And what they'll do is they'll pull the long air down to the above, which is called the emission by that. They'll mix it around at the ground level to bring the average to, uh, temperature of the orchard up to a place where fruit buds are safe. Right, essentially, that's what they do. That's how they heat things up. Unfortunately, there were no electric phosphating fans in New Zealand. Not only that, there didn't seem to be any electric phosphating fans in the world. Mm -hmm. And so, what I decided to do was, well, you know, being having an engineering background and having a software engineering background, generally being interested in this stuff, why don't I look at trying to convert some of these diesel phosphates to electric? Right, there's a gearbox at the top, there's a shaft down the middle of the pole, why don't we put an electric motor on the bottom? In the middle of COVID, we had all of us had a lot of time to do a lot of things. I was researching this. And found a website in Afrikaans of all places, uh, of all languages, um, that with a Google Translate, I realized that there was a company in South Africa that was actually building electric crossfire fans. The poor Afrikaner guy nearly fell off the cliff when I told him that I wanted to run his fans directly from the grid because anyone in South Africa, any, anyone who knows about the South African allergy electricity grid knows it's the most unstable grid you could possibly imagine. It's very, very good work. And uh, of course, what they had done is, is they were running these fans off diesel gen sets and, and, um, and grid, right? Because obviously, a diesel gen set running electric fan would probably save some form of diesel, but not only that, if you have access to the grid and the grid is actually running at the time, you would save a lot more money because electricity is a lot, lot cheaper. So, I had imported fans sight unseen. Um, from South Africa because it was in the middle of COVID and installed it myself because there was no one from South Africa that was able to fly over to install these fans. It was a very difficult time for a lot of us and for many others, I was really scratching my head as to how I could get my electrician to run a cable all the way out and then how I could install these phosphating fans using a local subcontractor. But we got the job done. And we got the job done thanks mainly to the help of uh, the uh, electric uh, energy. Efficiency Conservation Authority, ECA, who also gave us a grant. Now, that one farming, we hate the word subsidies, and so I don't call it a subsidy. What I actually call it is risk mitigation, because that's what it was. These fans were a lot more expensive to buy and install. You can see the prices there, the difference between the electric and the diesel version, um, what the incremental cost of capital was. 
Um, but with ours in the enterprise, and so I haven't included the grant figures in there because these actually have a really significant payback period by themselves. It's incredible. Yes, because of that transformer model, these are still the only two electric bus lane things. Right? So without that, I like, had another hundred and ten thousand dollars on the back, and it's really uneconomical, really quite well. Interestingly enough, these things are based on 150 hours at two dollars a liter of diesel. The price of diesel wasn't long that not that long ago it was three uh, three dollars a liter, and we actually bought the two hundred pounds last year. So all these figures are just numbers that I pulled out to try and be fair with these with these figures and these outcomes. Um, but in reality, it doesn't take much for these payback periods to uh, decrease significantly, significantly, or in fact, increase significantly, depending on the facts of time. I've got that hat, that's pretty cool. Um, this is what will be the first electric tractor coming to New Zealand, first commercial electric tractor. Again, I've got an eco demonstration graph in this because one of the biggest things that we need to do in order to electrify farming is replace the machinery. We've all heard the uh, the discussions around the new taxes not having any option for the life of one. What better thing that I could do than actually bring the first option to New Zealand? But as you can see, the price is incredibly significant and the payback period, even with rockets, really isn't something yet that we can convince other farmers that this is 100% the way to go, right? But it's cool, and I'm excited. As we be honest, it's a real sugar project, and that you've probably seen it on uh, on TV recently, or in the Hero magazine, or something. From an ego perspective, this is an amazing project because everyone pays attention to me and tells me how awesome I am. <laughs> but in reality, me being awesome, um, or it has nothing to do with the ability to affect farmers to change, right? And so this again is something. Again, I would not have this track if I didn't have the grid connection. It requires it requires three phase power to charge. It's a hundred and ten kilowatt hour battery. It's a significant piece, of, a significant electric appliance on top, right? And without that connection, I wouldn't be able to do it. One of the big things though about this is that if we look at just the numbers from a, a cost saving perspective from diesel to electric, it doesn't really stack up. However, this tractor is also driver optional. So the answer is if I can if I can automate 95% of our tractor hours on farm, well then the payback period is going to be longer. Right? And so that is really where the big innovation is coming in this space. And this is the current electric tractor. I don't need an electric tractor in New Zealand. Does anyone recognize that guy? He's a, he's a long from here actually. His name's Duncan. Um, and he converted uh, what I believe is New Zealand's only electric tractor, by ZP318. It's an 18 horsepower equivalent tractor. And one of the great things about playing in this space is that um, is, is that we get to meet kindred spirits. And he, like me, with no commercial modeling around whether or not converting something to electric is going to work, uh, basically built this tractor. Um, he built it with the help of a couple of grants, and now I lease it from him. And by leasing that tractor, I was able to play my wet zero fossil fuel nearly 80 months ago. Right? So that's, again, a significant part. Uh, all my journey has been relying on other people who are just as passionate about me, maybe with a slightly different disciplines. Interestingly enough, we have been able to do all orchard operations with an 18 horsepower equivalent tractor. But everyone was telling me that I needed an 80 horsepower thing. Right? Interesting. We have to change our tractor. Right now, a sprayer, a foliar sprayer or a cherry or hip will burn or will consume uh, about 45 kilowatts on the PTO at maximum RP, uh, RPM, which is almost a good spray. With the help of Nestor Blair Grant, we went back to the drawing board and designed a spray specifically for our orchard to run off Duncan's electric tractor, and we can do the same job with six kilowatts. Right? And so if you've got a, track, a small electric 18 horsepower tractor, with a 20 kilowatt hour battery pack, and you're trying to pull 45 kilowatts through a PTO, you're going to last about five minutes before you need to recharge, right? By changing this and having a spray that uses six kilowatts, we can now spray for up to a couple of hours, right? Which is also about the time it takes to completely get your tank. And with DC fast charging, we can charge that tractor back to full in almost the same amount of time it takes to remix and re the tank again. So with a little bit of behavioral change, we're now sitting in a situation where we are just as productive as an 80 horsepower diesel tractor on farm um, without burning nearly as much energy. 
And that's an important part of the interpretation. Not only do we need to change the source of the power that we're getting, but we also have to change our efficiencies. PTO is a hundred year old technology um, that, uh, let's be honest, has relied on the ability for us to fill up the diesel tank over and over and over again at a reasonable point. Right? This, uh, this sprayer doesn't run off PTO, it runs off a power plug, a socket, a 10 amp socket that we plug into the back of the tractor. One of the interesting unforeseen benefits of this is sometimes the wind picks up, we have to stop spraying. All we have to do is plug the sprayer into, the, into a socket in the wall and we can leave it agitating for as long as we need to before the, the, the wind settles down and starts spraying again. Uh, which means we don't either have to leave a tractor idle, we don't have to potentially dump it, which is the power matters. Road vehicles. Um, most of you, or a lot of you, I know, have, have EVs now. And uh, one of the only reason that I really bring this up is because so many farmers, we've had thousands of farmers come to visit um, our orchard in the last 12 months. And one of the biggest things that I've done, it's amazing how many of them tell me that electric vehicles are great for the city, but they're not great for the country. Oh, we'll turn them there if we are. That's why I'm still on here. Uh, but electric vehicles are great for the city, but not, uh, not for the country. And they actually couldn't be more wrong. Uh, they couldn't be more wrong. Uh, they, they couldn't be more wrong because literally the more cage you drive, the better you are off an electric vehicle. And so one of the things that I've had to do, and it has been a really painful experience for me because I love having my youth, but we got rid of our youth and bought the cars that we had available on the market at the time, which were two Hyundai cars. I then bought a three-day luggage, luggage rack, Stuck that on the back of the, the, the bike rack charger, uh, sorry, the bike rack total, uh, and I use that as my tray. So now we're in a circumstance where we can still go and pick up fertilizer from PGGs in town. I can still run the rubbish uh, into the dump. We can still do that kind of stuff, um, but we can do that without uh, the use of any fossil fuels as well. So again, it's about changing behaviors and really the backwards of um, I am very proud that there are a number of farmers in my region that now seem to have a huge hand lead. Um, that is actually pretty cool. I would like to say that some of that is a direct result of me telling them um, that rather than complaining about the tax, look at the government subsidy as well. And maybe have one image against each other about the just go back and focusing on positive energy rather than negative energy. Um, interestingly enough, uh, again with the government, uh, the clean car rebate, um, we're looking at an incremental payback of only three years. If I'm driving 50 kilometers a day, which I do, uh, because I have kids that uh, go to school 50 kilometers away from town, and we don't have a bus. Right, so again, we have to drive a lot of days for our family, a lot of days for our business, um, 50 days a day on average, um, and those savings are actually really significant. Uh, one of the cool things about being a uh, electric farmer, and one of the first, is that guys might still just come to the party and give us some water. <laughs> Um, so I can't put that into the calculations because let's be honest, you know, they would have a negative payback period by doing this. But you know, all from an auction operation perspective, the reason that I put this slide is that everything now can be done. It's as simple as that. Um, we also um, got to borrow an 11 ton electric truck, which was actually a real journey. I've got a whole lot of posts about that about getting an 11 ton electric truck from Christchurch to Cromwell for harvest. The long story short, short um, is that it's really hard to charge electric trucks and when the charging stations are in poky little areas and <laughs> in parking lots and supermarkets. You have to do a lot of social investment. You have to do a lot of explaining to people why it is that you need to take up five car lines <laughs> uh, in, the, uh, in, in the supermarket. But the great thing is, is that most people, they want to go sit in the cab, they want a photo taken. Uh, it was actually a pretty amazing experience to show that this can be done. The charging station prices at the moment but nationally are far too expensive for this to be economical. But the interesting thing is, if the price is cheap, as cheap as I can get it on farm for power, and I'll go to that in a moment, um, the, this, even though it's for a lot longer for a driver to get from Christchurch to Cromwell, it would have been just as even the price of people. So that's, um, that's something that I found, found really interesting. We've got a whole lot of about that as well. The answer is once we got it to farm, once we could charge it on farm, it was an absolute dream come true. It was the best possible piece of equipment that we have had. Um, we should get into the city that was that proved to be quite a challenge. A lot of farmers come to me and ask about power cuts. Um, obviously, that is a big problem. You know, if you're running a fully electric farm, you rely on it. What happens in the event of a power cut? Well, in the case of a lot of farming uh, operations, like in our case irrigation, it powers off for a couple of hours and then we peel, we'll pick it out. Um, the trees under the perennial crops aren't exactly going to die. Um, however, 
When it comes to frost fighting, if we had a power plant during the middle of frosts and these not working, the, the, the energy drops, we have no problem. We have no crop. Uh, we're talking about about a million to a million to a million and a half you know dollar crop a year. Um, this is a significant issue. Um, and uh, this is probably the one last thing that I had to solve. And, and at the time, the only way that I could see solving it was by having a backup diesel generator, which would cost me about forty thousand dollars. You know what I did? I went to insurance companies all over New Zealand, and unfortunately, none of them would insure me against the frost. The telephone company seemed to be insured against the frost. And actually, asked me to insure against the power plant that stops me doing my job, which is to fight frost, right? And none of them were going to listen to me because in the insurance industry, everyone is retrenching at the moment. So, funnily enough, you know, the biggest and possibly rudest shutdown. Was by one insurance company who actually was sponsoring the sustainability awards for New Zealand. So <laughs> go figure. Luckily, I had I found in Christchurch a really good insurance broker with GSI Partners, and I explained the situation and I worked with them. They put me in touch with their own insurance, which is some called Over in Brisbane, and together we were able to get around with the actuaries and we could follow this out. My moment out properly, we learned that in the last 10 years. For my property, there had only been two power cuts during frost fighting season, during frost fighting hours. Both of them were given us. So, frost, it's a very still night, means frosty. So, weather events probably not going to cause uh, power, power, uh, power outages. And also, let's be honest, I mean, we get frustrated with our electricity utility companies. There's no way they do anything at night time. And so, therefore, there's no schedule maintenance. There's nothing going on in that regard. Um, so the two power uh, the, the two power plants that had occurred were both caused by drunks hitting paddles. Right? That's an accident. Accidents are insurable. Right? As soon as we got to that point, I can now insure my entire fortune for eight hundred dollars against the power plant instead of forty thousand dollars. They suggested how cool is that? And I can still claim that I'm awesome because I don't use fossil fuels. <laughs> So yeah, so these are the figures, uh, the figures around the electrification of everything, uh, including uh, all of the uh, grant-related costs. So you can see that we have an incremental payback period of seven years and a total capital payback period of 13 years and carbon saved of around about 60 tons. Now that's only half the story, right? Um, bear with me, we'll get, we'll get to the rest in a moment. But what I can, um, what I can say on this front is that if you're starting with a blank canvas, we are almost at the point where I can convince a farmer you might as well go down this path. You know, it's cheaper. You've got a bit of a learning curve ahead of you, but you can probably do it. But the problem is, is that we're not really establishing a path in this country. We are running farms and looking to, to make them more sustainable. And at 13 years, that does not stack up. It just does not stack up. Uh, and so this is why government intervention is so important. So what about if we add solar and batteries? Well, the first thing I would advise to everybody is that if you add solar and batteries to your home or to your farm or to your business and you're still burning fossil fuels somewhere in that home or that business, all you are doing is cannibalizing the payback of the solar, right? Because there is no way solar can help you know when you're feasible. And so the number one thing I will always advise to people is electric first, right? Whether it's an electric vehicle, electric pump, Electric cost fire package, you want to be the second in the country that has those. Um, but that is the key thing. Electric, electric, electric. Get your power bill really, really, really high. Do the opposite of whatever New Zealand wants, right? Really push that power bill to the extreme because then it's really easy to model the payback on solids. <laughs> right. Um, so we actually have an award-winning system. In 2019, we won um, the Sustainable Energy Association New Zealand Best Grid uh, Connected System. Um, because I designed, once I electrified everything, I designed a system that worked really well for our farm, right? Um, but look at this, we've got 45 kilo, uh, kilowatts of solar panels on our shed. Um, we've got 120 kilowatt hours worth of batteries. That's the total capital spend. Annual energy savings of about $15,000 and a payback period of 18 years. Right, I was going to tell you that this is good, and that looks terrible. I don't know, 18 years is not really good. Expect a solar panel to last 25 years. You probably expect a battery to last about 12 years. So uh, it's one that the balance doesn't really, really add up. Um, however, this is what I come to call dumb solar. Right? And dumb solar is solar that you generate and use out with solar during the day when you're making it. And anything that you don't use, you store in batteries, right? Then it gets to nighttime when there's no sun, and then you drain those batteries slowly, right? 
right? And you try to sort of use as less power from the grid as possible. The reality is, is that power is really, really cheap at night, right? And power is normally more expensive during the day. And so how can we use these systems to be smarter? So the first thing was, so we have, I'm not sure what your line, charge, line company is here, um, in, in where I am, it's a more energy, but I think one of the most progressive lines companies is at, um, um, in, in, in New Zealand, although I'm still incredibly frustrated with them because when I talk about them being progressive, they're still very un uh, unprogressive when it comes to a, a software engineer slash cherry farmer's expectations of what we need to be doing in space. But I managed to get my line charge down from $12,500 a year on a 130 kVA connection to $3,100 by gaming and their buses. Right? And so essentially we're a pricing model, they, they charge me $12,500 a year and that is made up of how much I, they expect I should be paying for the consumption that I use during their congestion periods. Okay. Um, for those who know, it was, I'm not sure if this happens here, but it does, uh, during congestion periods, they'll turn off everyone's hot water cylinders and that's their, that's their answer to demand response to bring the, you know, the demand of the energy down. What I did was find that switch uh, that was used for hot water cylinders and put that into my switchboard, run a relay back to my um, to my software system, run some software to detect it. So I always export power the moment there is um, uh, the moment there is a congestion period. And so therefore I'm not taking any power during that time. And by doing that, I brought my line charge down from five thousand five hundred dollars to just over three thousand dollars, right? All of a sudden, if you're saving that kind of money, the payback period starts to look much, much more significant. But I didn't just stop there, I thought, well, now since I'm a player, um, why don't we look at going on the wholesale spot price market? Which actually was a real battle to get a retailer to put me on the wholesale spot price market. They come up with all these reasons about how they exist. You know, their, their policies exist to protect you. Um, you know, you don't want to do that because sometimes the price of power is five dollars a kilowatt hour, and you know, you'll end up, you know, having this untapped power, you know, un uncapped power. But I was like, no, 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 I'm, I've got batteries, I've got, I've got um, solar panels, and I've got soft, software knowledge. I think I can do this safely. Um, and so what I now do is I'll try to stop my market using the, the software, that, um, using the equipment I have available. So I buy power at my time, that's really cheap. I actually had a look this morning, the price of power was about one ten thousandth per cent a kilowatt hour. Right? And the reason was, is that lakes are really full, there's plenty of water, um, power's not really worth much because they can generate it pretty much for free. Uh, on the other side, um, only if, about a couple of weeks ago, um, the price of power is nine dollars. Right? Most people here will be paying about twenty-five cents a kilowatt hour. So you can see the value that a uh, if you don't want to take a risk, you can see the value that a retailer has. If you do want to take a risk and hedge the bet, hedge your bet yourself using some, some using batteries. It's not really much value for a power retailer anymore. And thank, thankfully. I found Simply Energy, um, and I found someone in Simply Energy that actually based here in Christchurch, named is Katie Mitchell, who supported me to go on a wholesale spot price market contract, uh, which has been an absolute revelation in the power industry, the fact that a cherry farmer has managed to achieve this. Um, but also, Simply Energy makes no money, right, because I had a close to a net zero energy bill. Um, I think that's a really important thing to sort of add um, into this. So, the payback stack on solar, now that I've actually run up on everything, it's 18 years, but if I say $10,000 by not paying or I bring it down to 10 years, um, if I arbitrage the spot price market and use the equipment that I already have, I can bring it down, down by another two years, but I actually think I can bring it down to 18 months, right? Um, and just a, one slide that I took out that I, I actually probably need to put back into this presentation is, just so everyone understands, it's about 50,000 already diesel bill out of the panel farm, right? By bringing it down and running purely on electrics, so not no solar, I brought it down to about 21,000. Right? What I can do with solar is double solar is bring it down, but not by much. But if I can get rid of those line charges and I can get rid of um, and then I start arbitrating the spot price market, I can get that right down to, to a, a very small amount, which is actually pretty cool. But the number one thing I want to stress is that the most savings comes from getting off diesel and off. Right. And then the solar stuff is just now that we're done with this, we might as well go down to save money. So, how do I get this down in 18 months? No. Right, we spoke about this in the last like, couple of presentations too. Um, is I want to create a brand of food, a new category in New Zealand for food that is grown without the use of fossil fuels. 
And that way, every department it doesn't matter what you're dropping, doesn't matter what other issues that you have with uh, uh, with greenhouse gases or what the political situation that we're in. If you can eliminate fossil fuels, then surely that is something that the consumer is going to want better. Than. And they did. Uh, thanks to Emma, uh, we got a grant from them to price trial um, our cherries in the supermarkets up in Auckland next to what I call oil cherries. So electric cherry versus oil cherries. <laughs> and what we achieved is about a 15% premium. Now, the way that we tested this, it's rather unscientific, but there's a terrible room, but essentially what we did is we started, we set the price really high and then we brought it down to, and we got the figures back from both the uh, the oil cherries and the electric cherries from the supermarket, and at about a 15% premium, we were shifting the same volume of cherries as the oil cherries, right? And that's how we know that it's about a 15% premium in the market. Not exactly scientific, but it's enough for me to know and have confidence that something does exist. A lot of people in this industry have said, oh, there's no green premium. Well, there's no green premium because we're not doing it properly. We're greenwashing existing businesses and existing ways of doing things rather than demonstrating understandable, systemic, and trustworthy behavior change in the way that we grow our food. Right? What, if I pick up a sign and it says carbon zero on it, what does that actually mean? Does that mean that you have eliminated emissions? Does that mean that you buy the New Zealand product or are you buying carbon credits from the Russian mafia? Like, there is no way for a consumer to easily tell. Right? And so what I wanted to do with the help of Agmark and with the help of the show quality is create a new certification in this country for the complete elimination of fossil fuels. Or as you can see, the transitional one, we're not there yet, but you're pleased to do it over the next five year period. Something that the consumer can trust is really easy to understand, and hopefully they will reward our food behavior uh, with a higher data sense. The issue that we have now is that we have a food system that is not, not built or designed in the right way to reward this. So the biggest thing from coming from being an inner city left in the city was not understanding how food, the food system, commodities work in Australia or indeed New Zealand. Uh, we are asking farmers to essentially overcapitalize on their farms and their businesses without offering any clear pathway for them to be rewarded. Right? And so this is what I hope to do. Now, I unfortunately have made the mistake of creating a certification that is almost impossible to be greenwashed. And by a result of almost impossible to be greenwashed, I've got no other people to join me on my certification. Right? But I realize that it's a long day. I'm convinced that the future of New Zealand is in electrification, and we have had a couple of other um, businesses now talk about coming on board and doing this, but it's going to be a much slower move. I really, really wish that I could just tell people they can pay to offset their bad behavior uh, because I have a really popular certification right now, but I don't, but that's not what this is about. And so finally, one of the big things that we have done um, is we sold about 10% of our crop last year to New Zealanders in New Zealand. This is our export crop, right? Uh, and that's not by the supermarkets, that's direct, direct business to consumer because with a broken system, the only way that I can really realize the value and communicate the value to the consumer is direct business to consumer advertising. Um, what we managed to do is get yeah, sold 10%. So last year we had about an eight ton crop and we sold about 800 kilos. Next year we've got a 30 ton crop. And the year after that we had a 50 ton crop. And the year after that probably a 90 ton crop. Right? Because our trees are getting older and more and more are coming on. So I'm really going to try and hold, um, you know, hold on to that 10%. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm looking to achieve. Interestingly enough, we were able to sell, we took the gate returns that we got from my orchard for export and we set that at the price. And we sold 10% to New Zealanders. Now, ironically, on the other side, when we dropped some of the fruit that we couldn't export down on the wholesale floor, we got about four dollars a kilo for it. I'm convinced it was sold for the same price as when I was selling before um, direct to consumer in the supermarkets to New Zealanders. New Zealanders are used to buying shit cherries at expensive prices. So why don't we just sell them good cherries at expensive prices that everybody wants? Um, so that's where I'm at. Um, we have our orders open for the second one of the business The promo code client action will give you a 10% discount on market at easyzero.com. Um, and I'll be around to answer a lot of questions. There usually are a few. Um, so, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Watch this. We're running a little bit late, but I think the talks was all three of them were really, really interesting. So I'm just going to let it go. We have uh, questions uh, now for you. 
So I'll sit up with a couple of chairs and I'll ask the speakers to pop in the beginning of the discussion. Any questions to the square model and give the first answer? Oh, I I I never um, the um, what it means somebody using things prior to the time they being pregnant and having the same There's no diesel tractors with an electric output. Sorry, there's no diesel tractors with an electric output. Right. So that's the that's the simple answer. Um there probably would be the ability to do it. Um, but if you were to do it, you would also then have to spend some capital building the new electric sprayer. So the, the payback probably wouldn't be there. I mean, we're talking about that track of a sprayer uh, probably costs a dollar twenty an hour to run. Um, if you were burning diesel, to you know, you have to burn the diesel obviously to move the tractor and to haul it. Um, I don't know what the hourly payback period would be on that, but it wouldn't be great. Right. Theories, risk, and supply. Yes, all the problems that I'm facing. I just very briefly, I travel quite extensively, and I was amazed at the number of theory uh, in New Zealand. And I look back over the years and I see lots of kids at the first occasion, and there's a lot of very sad stories, you know. You can, Run the whole list and even with a very favorable health product like black currants, the issue of those supplies. So, how concerned are you about oversupply not being able to sell at good prices? High, highly concerned. Highly concerned. Um, one of the key problems that we have is that New Zealand, I think New Zealand and Tasmania still grow the best cherry in the southern hemisphere. But we were here in South America was here, right? In the last 10 years, South America has gone to here and we've probably increased our power power as well as the levels. So as I've been Taiwan looking at this exact problem, the answer is, is that you can get cherries that only growers can tell the difference between coming from South America now. And in New Zealand, we are a high wage economy growing commodity products and they're trying to compete with the rest of the world. And that is an underlying what the concern is. The my orchard, and I'm not really looking at this from a how do we protect the cherry industry because I think the cherry, cherry industry is going to go through a lot of heartache soon because we can't grow with the premium that we need to survive isn't there uh, in the global export markets. Um, what I'm looking to do uh, with my cherry orchard is to try and make sure that I do have diversity of customer by selling directly into New Zealand using what I have been able to achieve. Uh, I'm also looking at other ranges of products that can come from my cherries that are also zero fossil fuel. Um, so the answer is, I'm really concerned. If you want to become a cherry orchard just now, now is the cheapest time to do it because there's a lot of cherry orchards on the market. Um, and I think you were saying that you were looking at getting into cherry plant. <laughs> Uh, there really is, at a, at a global level, there is a significant issue in that quality space, much like what, what, what the avocado industry has just been through, what the cherry industry will be going through. So, so Mike, just uh, yeah. <laughs> given what you just told us, too, why? Uh, I was just trying to my head since I've been back. I think we can come back to it. Yeah, and it was why I got into cherries. That's a really good question. <laughs> I don't really have an answer for that. Um, I'm very proud that we electrify cherries because um, they're the most thick, fickle crop I think you can possibly grow. And the fact that, from a technical perspective, we were able to do it with electricity, I think, means that there's not really an excuse for any other crop not to go down this path and do it. So I'm quite proud of it from a technical perspective. Um, I climbed the cherries originally because when I moved back from Sydney, I sold my business. It's a really stressful time in my life. I was 10 kilos heavier than I was. Uh, probably was drinking too much. I thought, what the worst thing I could possibly do is then just get straight into the New Zealand white season. Right, right. Now, I've got the question, John. Exactly on that. So, thinking about what you've just said about wine, et cetera, um, I seem to remember back in my teenage years, something called Cherry Granny or something like that. But anyway, um, 
if we've got this surplus out there with the type of brain you've got, what, where do you see some of the options for doing other things with your cherries other than selling yep. whole fruit? It's got to come from value-added products because we're not going to be able to compete on local right? So it has to come from, you know, look, look at all the famous food brands in New Zealand um, that are selling around the world their value-added products. I would like to get into wine now um, uh, for this exact reason that there's IP tied up in the products that you can then sell at a commercial level you know, overseas and you can tell a story with it. You can't, if I put a diesel cherry and an electric cherry side by side, you can't tell the difference. But, um, so that is the first thing. We're looking at a whole range of different um, products from basically desserts, candies, tweet, uh, crease, things like that, using using cherries. Um, I haven't, I can't put my hand on my heart and tell you that I haven't answered that question yet. At the moment, I'm in a luxurious position and we'll hopefully be in a good enough position for the next five to ten years that the export market's going to give me enough time to figure out how to do it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, just try and broaden the question a bit. Um, <laughs> it seems to me that society through its politics is focusing on the farm chain. And yet you've all mentioned capital, and you've all mentioned, I think, the need for more collective approaches. So, where's the change going to come that's going to make that? It's not just doing his thing, but that's a very individual thing. But a lot of the other stuff has to be connected. You can focus on changing that. Uh, so, there's, um, so, there's definitely a role of the corporate. So, what's the point of a corporate? I actually grew up on a family farm and I work for a corporate and I own a family farm. So I often ask myself the question, what's the role of a corporate? So the, the role of a large entity in the primary industries is to, is to take the risk on those innovations because they actually have the balance sheet and the ability to spread risk. On my own farm, I don't do any, any new innovations because it's a brand new farm and just trying to be a good farmer. But at Craig Moore, I'm able to spread that risk over 20, 30 farms. So that's the role of the corporate. And then the actual the role of the industry body, for example, during Z, is no longer to do the behind the farm gate innovation because it just doesn't have the skill base or size to do it. It actually its role is to represent the dairy industry around the world to to look for those innovations and then bring them back, invest in them if they can, and then bring them back to New Zealand to trial them on farms and then share them across the group. It'd be great if dairy Z and beef and lamb work together because it's basically the same industry. But then you start running into pol political issues, etc. Yeah, I think, uh, and I guess it's a sort of left field model as well, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, and, and the people we were talking to when we did the Central Bay Institute, you know, and they, and they were assuming that they were spending 90% of their time on 10% of their business. They had to work out the technology and how to produce it. They didn't have to try to create a market. They had to deal with these things. And I, and I think that is a real barrier. And I think really the, the ways you can do this collectively, whether it's through corporate or whether it's through cooperative type, collaborative type enterprises, or linking the processes through to the farmers as groups to be able to do it, I think offer more opportunity. And, I, and we talked about the, the diversity of like specialization as well. And I think that's right. You Maybe you don't need to get those skills. All you need to do is make an area of your land available to someone with those skills. And work out the arrangement how you can diversify without having to learn to grow kiwis or cherries or, or whatever it is. And I think you're right, it's, it's, it's innovation in the way we do business as well as the technologies, I think is, is key, key to this. Uh, and getting systems and arrangements that work for people, I think mean, it's challenging, but you know, again, how, how, how can we get systems which you know, reward the parties for it? I think it's, it's, yeah, I, I second that. I think the, the the biggest issue at the moment is that none of the industry is set up to reward farmers for being good farmers mm -hmm. unless they're at scale. And scale is a massive problem because you end up with spreadsheet farmers. Spreadsheet farmers don't care about the land that's being farmed. Spreadsheet farmers end up in this uh, situation where they can hide the environmental damage column in the spreadsheet very, very easily and then just look at the rest of the numbers and, and think they how good they are. So, uh, one of the big, that's, that's what I think, and coming into this industry, what the big problem is with scale and what we need to do is figure out ways of empowering the smaller farmer again, because they're the ones that actually care, they're the ones that are going to innovate, and they're the ones that are going to make the difference. Um, it's interesting that 
the story that I've just told you came from me just having a piss of money and deciding that I was going to do this, right? It is not something that I could have modeled. It is not something that I could have forecast. Um, it is not something I could have got lending from the bank for. It is not something. You know, it's None of that stuff is available. Now I'm in an interesting situation where the government's now coming to me and asking how they should structure a lot of the, the capital investment they do with sustainability on farm. Uh, and the banks are coming to me and asking how it is they should structure, um, you know, financial services and financial products for the same thing. Um, but a lot of this innovation can't be modeled, it can't be, it can't be done traditionally. Um, it has to just be something that we explore and figure out. Um, one guy probably don't mention enough in their presentations how many mistakes I made along the way. Um, you know, if, if I could go back and do this whole thing again, I might have been able to really, really squeeze down that payback period um, a lot better. Thank you so much. There are a couple of questions in the front here, but please in the back. Deep questions as well, right? And um, I have um, Nick first, then I have Patrick, then I have the gentleman with the beautiful beard. Yes, hi, Alan. I appreciate it. You're seeing us far away, like being a famous place for a long time, the side away, like you can see the human bridge, which had we were going to ask me in farms that were put on my farm, but trying to get a diversification within farm and side ice. What do you see as a potential way forward to overcome that? If we don't overcome it, we have to think of everything that's happening. Yeah, no, I mean, I guess it's, it's one of the things to identify the problem, but how do you get that across? I mean, one of the things I guess they did a bit in the UK, as you think, is they actually put all those development bodies into one body effectively, it was the way they tried to challenge some of those. Uh, Issues and they weren't looking at about stylization. I mean, they were doing for initiative purposes, but actually, uh, they linked them up into the agricultural development board. And so, maybe ways thinking about how that works together could be some, some way of looking, looking at it. Um, yeah, I mean, is I don't know, I don't know too much about M MPI on farm support, for example, but I guess. Other bodies that can cherry pick from the different sectors in which you can get pretty cherry, obviously, um, but cherry pick the different parts of it and actually begin to mix and match some of the advice, I guess, across across the sectors. But yeah, I mean, yeah, the difficulty is, is where, where's the money for the research and development? It's in the dairy. That's generating the biggest levy, they've got the biggest funds. So the small sectors are, are struggling in that way. And I think that's that, that is a challenge. And I'll also add when you're a rogue grower, the member based organizations don't like it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. So, um, my question for Alan. So, coming back to this project that you're doing on um, understanding farming, farmer sources of information and how to access them, to what extent are farmers looking through the supply chain? Uh, in terms of the types of information that they, they need and are trying to access. Is the focus primarily behind the farm gate and maybe looking at the you know, selected market or consumer base? Or is there a systematic approach to looking through the supply chain and the information associated with it? That's interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I might pass on to Amy because she's been on speaking talking to them. Did you hear the question, Amy? It's about information beyond the farm gate. So looking, are they how are they access information more about the supply chain and I guess the customers right through the customers right, 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 right. did you discuss much on that? Uh, I think the first one of all is obviously the result. I was curious about the thing, but I have to be here with the government. So it's the first thing we're getting done is not our own service. Um whether or not that's good quality information. But when you mean beyond the farm gate, you know what you mean by that, like the distribution. Well, the whole distribution, yeah, the whole distribution thing. Um, you don't have to go back very far, particularly over, over the COVID period, to look at um, the price of containers, the world price of containers, for example, just to take a very really simple part of that, um, but not simple. Uh, and then you look at the letters that the minister gets from Tesco's 
um, saying what the demands are going to be from their point of view. So you've got to think about all of these different aspects uh, <coughs> as you evaluate a new project, I guess, of, of white people and, uh, and also student <laughs> doing stuff at scale. Yeah. Um, I guess if you're doing stuff at scale and you've got a big enough organisation, then you're going to do that with through supply chains. But if you're a farmer from Southland, you're thinking, I've got all of this stuff coming at me, all the regulatory change, and then what would change this and what change that? How the hell am I going to understand something that goes with the supply chain when I'm grabbing with all of this other stuff? No, again, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess I can kind of speak to that a little bit. It's, it's right, and it comes back to it. I said that in the advanced system, there's a huge difference between the way corporates access and engage with information versus on the data farm, especially with we're seeing a huge complexity of information, the technicalities of information, um, not reports. When they engage with this stuff, you know, a lot of farms, particularly on the data farms, which are really overwhelmed. I think that typical information overload is a really real thing, and they often switch off because they're engaging with these things. Um, it's a typical thing I hear, you know, I don't even know where to start. Um, and that's that's a real issue. And again, it comes back to specialization. Um, many of them feel confused. And unfortunately, not only the increasing environmental complexity, there's other things associated with health and safety information. If you find there with farm cells, they just can't keep up with the experts and everything. So I think it's a really important role to get a model program as well. And I think there's a role there, I mean, intermediaries, I think, yeah. would seem to me to people who could, could grasp the market information and the supply chain information and then bring it back to the farmers. But of course, the again, the issue is who's capturing the value in this and how, how, how do they capture value? Yes, there might be an opportunity, but by the time it gets to the farm, if someone else has really got the idea and worked it out, they know how they're going to take the, the profit from it. And so I, I think there's some challenges in, in that in a way. Just add to that a little bit to the farms who set themselves up with a really good advisory board. Um, because you can essentially part of the world that sort of extent. You can surround yourself with the likes of knowledge that really helps that um transition. But yeah, certainly that the price of information is quite important very well and that sometimes comes But there's also huge opportunities online as well, especially sharing the same evidence which we Thank you so much. And I have a question in the back as well. So I have the gentleman here, I have the gentleman with the with the jacket and the last question in the back. Yes. So um, we heard a lot about financial risk and <clears throat> upfront costs, but at the same time, we reduce the general public to its willingness of paying 15% premium after the fact. Um, well, but why is there no better way for people to invest in this? What, or, or what could be a better way for somebody like me to support these changes by not just buying me zero? Uh, yeah, so is, is there more like a, a is, is there a structural issue that can, that society can can address in a better way than at the moment relying on banks to give the right loans to the right people? I mean, it takes a bit of community support in agriculture and those concepts where you kind of buy into the, the farm and the, the process that you support them or crowdfunding to the happy cow will go along. You know, potentially, I guess there are those mechanisms available in there. The, the problem that exists is that I can't take your money responsibly because none of the activity that I'm doing, I can guarantee that I'm going to give you any form of return back anytime soon because I'm investing in the climate and innovation and not in shares. So the product that I use and the reason that I'm here are two very, very different things. Um, and there's no way of modeling that. It's like, it's almost like there needs to be a third construct. You've got the private business, you've got charity, and you've got something in the middle, which is but not making profit entity because we choose not to, but we do for something else. Um, and so I just never raise money externally um, from that because the only thing I can really sell you on is investing in a cherry orchard. 
but yeah, technically we have the, we have NGOs, non-government, non-profit organizations, and if I give them money, I just assume that they do something for the greater good, etc. And not to give me back my money, but still I can't just be I cannot donate money towards this chamber and do what you said from outside. I think it's my observations from moving back to New Zealand is that New Zealand has a very, very weak NGO right? And as a result, the people that advise government are usually people with best interests. Um, they could be doing it very effectively and genuinely, but they still have very best, uh, best interests. Um, and so I think that's big talking on New Zealand as well. Um, you know, I can make on one hand, as you as I can pick up the power of the Maybe just go next to the main one. Don't underestimate the power of the banks. That, that's going to be the major change force in the next five years. And the other factor is if you want to invest in something, invest in the innovative space around agri tech. Because the, it's the one in 10 that's going to make a big difference to New Zealand. The question before Ella, you. Briefly touched on agricultural tourism. Are you able to expand the study to include tourism sector as a whole? The reason being is that there's developing a great degree of unfairness between the way the farmers of rumen and animals are being treated with respect to emissions compared with the tourist sector. To put a point on it, um, the ruminant animal farmers are facing substantial taxes on emissions. And yet the tourist sector, as far as I can determine, is facing no equivalent in tax them for the huge emissions that are involved in the tourist sector. Yeah, no, I mean it's I mean, I guess recently there was this talk of the departure tax, and the, that's what's called the greenish green tax as people leave the country. Um, but it's obviously not in specific systems, but that's on the whole, I guess, thing about, about coming here. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it's right. Jim might want to play over that. This is going to be very tasty. I'm going down on the ITJ. So, um, yeah, I think there, there, there are a range of different ways in which it is being captured. So, for example, um, some of the councils are beginning to put big tax and other environmental tax on uh, to deal with uh, infrastructural issues. Um, the tax, the GST that comes in from tourists prior to COVID, we wanted to start with that um, that can be invested in some of the infrastructure around the country. I mean, yeah, the EFA is a constantly um, the, the biggest concern. Um, but the EFA is making about 17%, I think, of the Emissions that's actually coming in is, is quite small. There's also a lot that goes into around the country with them as well. So, one of the big concerns I know Stuart Nash is talking about high value tourists coming in. The high value tourists actually use way more carbon here you know, than the low value tourists yeah. who travel around the country and pick breaks and put that in society. So, um, the Up Ontario Circle has just released a tourism education plan um, in the last couple of weeks. To look at you know, uh, dealing with that, but I think um, I went to the tourism industry conference last year, and there's a real mismatch between discussions about regenerative tourism and also growing the number of groups. And those two things are not sitting together comfortably at the moment. They're, they're, they're. Yeah. So, on the one hand, they're saying we need regenerative tourism, on the other hand, they're saying how do we get five groups? Um, so there's a real mismatch, but again, most tourism operators are small businesses, like most most farmers, and so again, you know, they want to make a living, and it's, it's, it is a really good thing. Thank you, Joe. For the sake of time, um, the last question in the back of the room, and then I'll invite you, you're allowed to stay, and chat to everybody and have a cup of coffee, and I think there is a little bit of fruit left as well, so... Uh, have a snack and you're welcome, welcome to stay to continue to your discussions. But we're more of a comment rather than anything, but I think the last 18 months and the last couple of years we've seen such a significant improvement in the level of information being able to give to farmers and to further to your point, Angela. It's a silly example tomorrow. Be late to have a little bit of a seminar around climate change, NZIPOM, we have one and have further around supply chains. 
and our land and water have a seminar around the data super. And then so there's been a huge amount of information and, and, and even from when you were doing the surveys, I mean, now there's just you're overwhelmed with I'm gonna try and decide which one I'll go to, but I've got a bit more room to as well. Um, inspired by the stuff. But how do we get everyday mum and dad parliament to just to not be overwhelmed? But to try to put a layer of thinking around them to support them and to and so that the years ahead of where the change adaption is going to be necessary. I don't know. Well, like you said, it also should be pushing, but uh, actually a really cool and uh, <laughs> the closing argument. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So much for that. Um, I think. Uh, um, so thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for the absolute, absolute fantastic panel because you guys wouldn't have stayed if these guys have done a job. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Check out our website for more events to come and thank you very much.